As you're about to see, Jim is a gifted integrator. He has a mind that puts together so nicely constructs that come from intensive meditation practice, that come from psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and come from having a deep understanding of trauma work. Thanks so much, Jim, and welcome. Well, thank you so much, Ron, for, for hosting this and for inviting me. And it's great to be here with everyone. Yeah, so I'm part of the Boston site uh, for the MAPS trial, and we heard great things about the data coming out of that from Rick Doblin yesterday, as well as the history and how much he did to bring this into being. And I just want to express that gratitude to Rick and what a pleasure it is to know and, and, and work on his project. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about clinical and contemplative aspects of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and particularly for PTSD, because that's what we've been doing. And I want to start, though, with a couple of, you know, just cautions. So I am not suggesting or recommending or condoning any activities that are illegal in the United States or are outside of ethical clinical, clinical practice. You know, it's, it's really important, especially for those of us involved in the research, to just be very careful about how we use these medicines and, and how we're perceived as, as um, you know, what we're advocating for. And so I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. There are risks of using uh, MDMA, uh, especially outside of legal and safe treatment contexts. And you know, here's some of them, right? So if you're buying it uh, outside of the pharmaceutically pure MDMA that we have for the study, it can have dangerous impurities. Uh, the dose can be unknown and dangerously high. Uh, there can be, if there's insufficient or incompetent preparation or support, uh, during or after the experience, people can have very difficult experiences, especially people with histories of trauma and complex trauma. And so people can get hurt, right? They can get psychologically hurt. There can be bad social things that happen. People can get physically hurt. So we just need to be very aware that, you know, this is a medicine that in the wrong set and setting can, can harm people and, and, you know, obtained illegally and of unclear, you know, contents. It can be very dangerous. And even if treatment is done well, even with the best therapists who are very well trained, uh, there's still risks involved in this treatment. So people can recover memories or access memories that they already had uh, to a much more intense level than they had before. And this can be destabilizing. So as we all know, doing trauma treatment, sometimes people get worse before they get better. And that can happen in this treatment as well. People can get really attached to positive experiences or do you know kind of a spiritual bypass thing. And this can stall their healing. It can lead to psychic inflation and grandiosity. This can definitely happen with MDMA, not just um, psilocybin and other psychedelics. And people can also, as someone alluded to yesterday, sometimes if people have these experiences, they can get so attached to this model that they may devalue other modalities of therapy. Um, but there's, you know, especially as Francis, uh, my friend and colleague is gonna talk about for integration, we can bring all kinds of different psychotherapies in and you don't necessarily need to keep using MDMA or any other psychedelic, um, but sometimes people really get attached to it and think that's what they've got to have to keep progressing. And often that's just not the case. So those are some of the risks that I just wanted to address out front. So again, I'm going to be talking about clinical and contemplative aspects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the clinical um, dimensions here. First, as we heard from Rick yesterday, and we've heard a bit today from Bill and from, from Libby and Susan, you know, there's a therapeutic approach that goes back to the 50s and 60s that was used with LSD psychotherapy that's been used through the Hopkins work and, and other work that's going on now. And, you know, this image is an iconic image from the MAP study. That's Michael and Annie Midhofer there with a participant in the study. And some of the key elements of this approach are that it's non-directive. As we've been hearing, it supports the emerging experience with spontaneously emerging from within that person's mind, from, from their body, from their soul, however you wanna think about it. This concept of inner healing intelligence, we've heard it uh, a couple of times now over the last two days, and it is so central, and I'll return to it several times during my talk, that there's this deep faith that within all of us, we have the capacity to heal, and that it doesn't need to come from the outside, it's just a matter of creating the conditions where this can emerge. And a lot of what we do in the preparation is really convey to the participant or the client in psychotherapy setting, just how much confidence and faith we have in them and in their own capacity to heal themselves. And we explicitly introduce this concept as part of the MAP study, this inner healing intelligence. 
Another really key idea is this idea of going inside, closing your eyes, having eye shades on, putting on the headphones and going inside and being with what is emerging in your experience with trust in your inner healing intelligence, or at least trust initially that the therapists um, have that trust and that faith in you. And that's a really important part of this therapeutic approach. And there's an alternating focus of going inside and talking with the therapist. Sometimes it's 50-50, like Rick said yesterday. Sometimes it's 75% of the time inside. You know, Libby and I worked with a, a participant recently who would be in there for like 40, 45 minutes um, before coming out to chat with us for three or four, and then we'll go back inside for a while. And that's okay, you know, it can, it can really vary. But, but there is alternation. And if someone's inside for a really long time, we will check in with them, of course. And uh, as we said yesterday too, it really allows for the unique skills and styles of individual therapists. And, you know, we can hear that in, in what we're hearing from Bill and Libby and Susan today as well. And that's so important that you can bring who you are as a human being, who you are as a therapist, what trainings you have, what skills you have to this work. And another critical thing about this approach is that preparation and integration work. The preparation comes before anyone ever takes any medicine. And in the MDMA study, that's, that's three preparation sessions, including one that's like three hours just before the other one, before the first medicine session. And then those integration sessions are really, really important. And again, Francis is gonna talk about that later. But I, I can't emphasize enough that it's not just about what happens in the sessions, but laying that groundwork through preparation. And when this is legal, you know, that might mean six or eight preparation sessions, you know, that you can do outside of the constraints of research studies. Um, so really I look forward to the day when it's legal and we can adapt our preparation to the unique individual and, and what they need to really get ready. So I have this slide, you know, because I, I, I do wanna emphasize this idea of the inner healing intelligence and, and this imagery of like this invisible sun within all of us, this radiant infinite love and wisdom and joy and playfulness and beauty. It is just the nature of existence and manifests through us. And this is, you know, these are mystical things I'm saying, um, but these are things that we see and, and experience over and over again in this work, whether it's ketamine assisted or MDMA or psilocybin, if you've heard from Bill, there's this inner healing capacity and wisdom and intelligence and radiance within all of us. And that's what this therapy is about. Whatever the medicines, a big part of it is helping people to access this and unfold it. And so again, back to this iconic image of the MDMA studies with Michael and Annie. And this person is you know, going within to access that inner light, that inner healing intelligence, that unfolding process within themselves. And another way to think about this, you know, Michael Midhofer used to be an emergency room physician before he went into psychiatry. And so he set and put casts on a lot of broken arms. And one way to think about this is that in the same way that the body heals itself in so many ways, if you put the cast on, your work is done. The body will heal the broken arm. And so in this work, in a similar way, we're creating conditions and we're supporting a process that emerges spontaneously from within the client. And that's just so central to this work. This is a really important, the wall of text there, we're not gonna read this, but this is a really nice, short, important uh, paper that Michael Midhofer wrote on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, where he talks about these key elements of the therapy and how it can be similar to and different from other therapies. And I highly recommend this. You just Google this phrase. It's free as a PDF on the MAPS website. Um, and this is a really nice, brief but profound uh, introduction to this work uh, by the principal investigator on the MAP studies um, and, a, and a really wise and, and loving man who I'm so grateful to have learned from. And this is taken from that brief paper by, by Michael Medhofer. So, you know, and he talks about these elements that are in other therapies that spontaneously emerge in these MDMA assisted sessions. And so of course we need a safe and supportive setting as everyone's been talking about Imaginal exposure, if we're talking about treating post-traumatic stress people with trauma, this idea of, you know, people within their imagination encountering and remembering, you know, their worst traumatic experiences and processing those. That's a big part of this work. A lot of cognitive restructuring spontaneously happens uh, in these sessions. A lot of psychodynamic processes can emerge. 
And that can include really strong transference reactions. As people have talked about, these are typically a male and female therapist team and people can you know, project onto you, uh, their, their parents. And that can be a really powerful part of the work. Corrective attachment, you know, and people have talked about how, you know, an MDMA session can feel like you're doing five, you know, years of therapy in, in, in eight hours. And a big part of that sometimes is very profound reworking of early attachment stuff um, with, with the therapist in, in this state. So that can be a really important part of the work. I'll come back to this theme as others have touched on, Libby and Susan, the multiplicity of the psyche. People spontaneously start doing IFS for themselves, basically, repeatedly in these sessions. And that's something I'll talk about more. Somatic processing is a super important part of this. You know, there's real fascination, especially with the neurobiological uh, focus in our culture at this time. Uh, a lot of interest in the default mode network and cognition and narrative and letting go of those. And, and these are all really important aspects of these therapies. But the, the bodily wisdom and the bodily processing that happens is, is profoundly important part of this. And especially in MDMA where people are not leaving their bodies and going to other realms or you know, encountering Gothic cathedrals and things like that for the most part, it's a, MDMA brings about a very embodied personal narrative healing process. It can definitely have mystical aspects to it, but it tends to be very much people in their bodies and, and that somatic processing is a really important part of this. Active imagination, this is a Jungian concept, but it's something that just spontaneously arises, that people have these imaginative experiences. And a lot of it is about envisioning their future in ways that are full of hope and love and playfulness, as we'll hear. Um, and this is a really important part of the therapy. And then finally, as you know, we've talked about a lot the last couple of days, you know, these spiritual and transpersonal things can emerge spontaneously and do in MDMA sessions for a lot of people. But interestingly, it's not the mystical experience that's correlated with healing, as Rick talked about yesterday. That's in the, in the PTSD studies. It's, you know, not surprisingly with MDMA, that's a very embodied experience for much of the time. It's not about going to some other realm or usually even the archetypal stuff, though that can come in. But the, the mystical stuff isn't the healing ingredient um, in the MDMA, though, of course, it can be, but it's not what's associated with the reduction of PTSD symptoms, right, the main outcome in, in, in that trial. So a really important concept here is, you know, Rick talked yesterday about how, yes, there's different therapeutic modalities that are involved in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and that the therapist employs these in a responsive way, not in a directive way, Rick said. And one way that Libby and I and others have talked about this is that, you know, you bring all your toolbox as a therapist, but again, you're responding and with a light touch. You know, so here, you know, metaphorically, you know, playfulness is a big part of this and creativity. And so people have these processes emerging within themselves. The therapeutic modalities are kind of spontaneously emerging and you can bring what you have to offer, but it's with a light touch, just like a toddler who's exploring, you know, and he's got his hand on the, on the couch there and people are supported by the medicine as, been, as has been talked about. And our role as a therapist is like the parent with a toddler who, you know, wants to do it for themselves and, and has the capacity to walk. We don't have to teach them how to walk. We just hold them with a light touch. And sometimes we offer a little guidance here and there, um, but really we respect you know, their unfolding of learning to walk or, or the healing process in MDMA. And so I just wanna emphasize that, that yes, you can bring all you have as a therapist, but without attachment and with a light touch. And Michael Midhofer, you know, some of these slides I've borrowed and adapted from a talk he, he's done because I, you know, so admire him and he just has a lot of great things to say. And this is one I got from Michael and adapted a little bit. And he quotes Irving Yalom, who says, you know, the therapist must strive to create a new therapy for each patient. But we can take that further and maybe the therapist can support and encourage each person to create a new therapy for themselves. And, and I love that model. And that's really what we're doing here. And as we've been hearing from other people too, we're creating the conditions, we're supporting a process where the, the patient or the client is creating their own unique therapy and it's unfolding in the preparation, it's unfolding in the medicine sessions and in the integration sessions. And that's really a, a wonderful, beautiful thing about this is it's not some manual that we're imposing things on people. We're, you know, like Rogers and others have pointed out for so long, we are helping them heal themselves and create their own therapy. 
So here's some of the things that people say about this. You know, one important notion to dispel is that, yes, MDMA can be very ecstatic. That's why it's called ecstasy. It can be very warm and loving. But if you're going into this with the intention of healing trauma, especially, uh, it can be difficult. It can involve confronting the most painful, the most shameful experiences you've had in your life. And so, you know, this is a quote from a participant in the phase two studies. And, you know, I don't know why they call this ecstasy, because in that session, uh, that person was having, you know, some quite difficult, painful memories come up. And yes, they may have had some distance from them, but they can be very intense and, and, and excruciating in some ways as well. And in terms of the transference, you know, as, as Libby and Susan talked about, holding people's hands can be an important part of this process, hand on the shoulder. Um, and sometimes people will ask you to do things like brush their hair. And there's ways in which you can respond uh, authentically and do things that you wouldn't ordinarily, ordinarily do in a psychotherapy, but in a way that is safe and boundaried and supportive of, of what they need and what they're asking for. And, you know, again, people have to really be well-trained and ethical therapists, but there is room for, for doing things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And some of these really strong transference responses can evoke that. And that's an important part of this therapy in many cases. On this topic of multiplicity of the psyche, you know, these are some quotes from a participant that Libby and I recently just met with for the last time. He finished the study on Thursday um, and uh, he's doing incredibly well. And I'll say a little bit more about him on the way. But this quote here on the left uh, top is what he said just 35 to 40 minutes into his first MDMA assisted session with us. He said, all the different parts of me were sitting together in a circle one by one I took each by the hand and we had a conversation. And he had these conversations of care and love and inquiry into their experience and supporting them. And again, this just emerged spontaneously. He had only heard about IFS for like 10 minutes, just mentioned in passing kind of by his therapist like months before. He didn't even know anything about IFS, um, but this is what he spontaneously did. And in a later session, he talked about having conversations with his parts and how he reassured them that you know they didn't need to feel be so afraid that he was going to take care of them they were going to be okay um so the ifs work emerges spontaneously and this is something that michael midhoffer saw you know in his work um and, and he got ifs training back with libby years ago and so this is a really important part of the work that people spontaneously do ifs for themselves in many cases and as as has been said you know it it gives you this access in ifs language to very strong self-energy that allows this work to happen. As I was saying before, the, the somatic and bottom-up processing aspects of this are so important. Um, bringing awareness to the body, encouraging movement sometimes. People can get stuck and intuitively as a therapist, you can have a sense that it might help them to move and you can encourage that. Uh, optional mindful use of touch with permission and careful agreements. So well before the medicine session happens, that first one, there's been discussion in, in, term, in the preparation process about the potential for touch, it's non-sexual touch, the person can give you a signal to stop at any time, you inquire about what kind of touch they think might be supportive and what they might be open to. And so all that groundwork has been laid before you would ever engage in touch in one of these medicine sessions with the person that's expanded state of consciousness. And, but it can be very, important part and there can be really nurturing touch, um, you know, with the brushing of the hair or, you know, holding hands in certain ways. And as was mentioned with the holotropic breath work, uh, you know, sometimes there can be really intense releases, cathartic releases that people have in their body and that can be an important part of the work. But again, you don't want to get outside of your competence and training with these sorts of things. Um, but this is, there's a real potential for this. And here's a progression of quotes from our rec most recent participant in the MDMA study. You know, in the, in the first and second study, uh, medicine session, there were times where he was sitting there and, and his eyes would be closed and with the eye shades on, he'd just be shaking his head back and forth with this aversive response and sorrow response to the abuse he had experienced by his father and witnessed his father perpetrate against his mother as a child. And he's a very big hearted guy who was also just feeling so much the suffering of other people in the world in these sessions. And He's someone who walked around a lot with a furrowed brow and clenched hands. And in these sessions, you, we watched his hands start to open up and unclench. And then his arms 
you know, for many minutes in some of these medicine sessions, his arms would be down at his side with his hands open. And you could just see it. He didn't have to tell us, you know, he was in the state of open embodied receiving gratitude. And that was a really important, powerful part of his healing. And then from there, his hands, you know, moved to his heart. And he would just be feeling this just a massive compassion for himself and others, and even people who had hurt him. And that was, you know, just a huge part of his experience. And finally, he, not a religious guy before this, but he spontaneously found his hands in this position. And he used the phrase prayer hands. And this came up several times in his medicine sessions. So the, the embodied aspects of this are so important. And over and over again, we see these as just fundamental to the experience. And even as Libby and Susan were saying, even with a quote dissociative anesthetic like ketamine, it helps people be in their bodies often. And that's a big part of the experience. So those are some clinical aspects of this work. Of course, much more could be said, but that's a framework I wanted to give you based on Michael's beautiful short paper um, and quotes from participants and some things that I've observed. And now I wanna to shift to contemplative aspects. So first, you know, a definition, you know, this is taken from American Heritage Dictionary. Uh, you know, what does contemplation mean, you know, in popular parlance? Uh, thoughtful observation or study, meditation on a spiritual matter, intention or expectation. And this is really important. A lot of the contemplation that we see in the MDMA sessions are people contemplating their own future, contemplating how they're going to be in their bodies, how they're going to be in their relationships, in their communities. Uh, so people are contemplating many things very deeply, and some are in the past, some are in the present, experiences of openness and peace and liberation, and some are contemplating the future uh, in, in very transformative ways. And again, I return to this slide with the kind of the infinite, you know, sun of wisdom and love within us all. And, and we can think about when people are in these medicine sessions, and here I'm talking about MDMA, but this happens with ketamine and psilocybin and others as well as degrees of access or intensity and embodiment of the infinite love and wisdom and joy and playfulness and beauty within us. And so in typical psychotherapy sessions on a really good day, right, we can, we can help people access pretty intensely some of this, this love and wisdom and healing potential within themselves. But as someone who's done work with these medicines for a few years now uh, in the therapy role, you know, I have to say that, you know, people can access so much more powerfully with the assistance of these medicines in the right set and setting with the right preparation with therapists who bring the right attitude and skills to it. Um, that they can just really get intense access uh, and real embodiment of these transcendent capacities uh, that we all have within us for healing and for joy and, and play and everything. And so one way to think about contemplation in this work is people can contemplate, quote, the bad, and I put that in quotes, right, because, you know, there's not so much bad trips, but challenging trips. Uh, there's traumatic experiences uh, that are challenging to, to come to terms with. And, you know, so people can really experience with the support of the medicine and, and the therapists and, and, and all the preparation work, they can experience intense traumatic memories, intense pain, shame, guilt, all kinds of really difficult things, and they can contemplate these things. They can experience them with equanimity, with wisdom, with love, and they can heal them by experiencing them very deeply with access to these inner capacities. And so I you know, think about this as part of the contemplative aspect of the treatment. People are contemplating suffering, their own personal suffering, in a very profound way and healing it. But also people are contemplating and accessing really good things and transcending goods that transcend default mode networks, quieting down and anything we could ascribe to our brain. People are, you know, accessing, you know, infinite love and joy and playfulness and beauty. And these are experienced uh, in, in very powerful ways and experienced in people's bodies uh, in, in, in very healing ways. And so when I think of the contemplative aspects of MDMA assisted psychotherapy is contemplating the the, the suffering in, from one's past and still rising in one's present. And, but it's also contemplating these transcendent goods and accessing them and really orienting toward the future and how one will embody these and seek to embody these with the support of others, including you know, meditation practices and, and religious communities, whatever people are finding supportive. 
So something I've seen, you know, I'll admit, you know, I haven't done that many of these sessions, right? The, the, you know, we're a couple years into this uh, phase three study and each therapy pair gets to work with a few people, maybe four or five. Um, so I'm not like the most experienced person working with this. Um, but one of the nice things about the training was that we, you know, spent five or six days together twice, you know, a whole group of people with Michael and Andy Midhofer, these, you know, wonderful, experienced MDMA therapists. And we watched video after video after video of people in preparation and medicine sessions and integration. And one of the things I noticed from watching those and have also seen in the work that I've done, uh, that Libby and I have done, is a common progression. Now, I'm not saying this happens for everybody, but this is something that I have seen commonly progress in terms of the contemplative aspects of this work. And so often in the first MDMA session, it's a very contemplative session. So the MDMA dampens down the fear circuitry or the defense circuitry, we could call it, and fear recedes and equanimity just spontaneously arises and mindfulness and compassion spontaneously arise in very powerful ways. You know, that self-energy that IFS talks about. And also there's this, as people talk about with mystical experiences, and they can be mystical, um, this noetic or revelatory aspect of contemplative experience emerges and profound wisdom and insight into themselves and their suffering and, and also the keys to their happiness, perhaps. But often in these first sessions, it, it, there's a sort of equanimity and, and distance to it. It's very engaged, but it has that, that equanimity and, and distance to it often. Again, not always. Um, but then what we commonly see in these um, people with PTSD and on MDMA is in the second and third sessions is where they can really go deeper into the trauma processing. So they can process and purify things and make commitments to things. And so they can have a, a much deeper emotional, emotional engagement, engagement sometimes, sometimes you'll see with the difficult material in those second and third sessions. Uh, they, they can relive fear and sadness and shame and you know, really painful, difficult ways, but in the context of loving acceptance of the medicine and the loving attention of the therapist and everything else um, provides for them. And people get experiences of liberation from their suffering after going deeply into it, liberating from it. And people get experiences, again, not just of working with their, their suffering, but of accessing really transcendent goods uh, that we all have access to potentially They're just part of life and being human. And, and this is a really important part of the work. And it's a very important contemplative aspect of the work, I would say. And this links up with, as I was saying before, people envisioning positive futures. So our most recent participant, he would have these visions of of playing with his friends and having fun and not feeling like he had to perform or finally being playful sexually and in intimacy, which was a, a big thing that he you know, needed healing with and has found that healing through this, this work. And so people envisioning positive futures with this clarity and this confidence um, and knowing they can do it as, as Bill talked about with some of the people you know, who are with the psilocybin and addiction, knowing like I can put aside cocaine, I can put aside alcohol or whatever, they're addicted to, like with utter confidence, they know this. Now, of course, it's going to take some support and integration work afterwards for most people to sustain those intentions. But that is one of the most important parts of this work. And I would say one of the most important contemplative parts of this work, contemplating one's future with clarity and confidence and having a clear vision of the love and the joy and the compassion and the play that is, that is coming. And so, you know, here's a couple of quotes from participants in this, you know, a feeling of deep love and tranquility, feeling connected to the universe. And so people do sometimes have very mystical uh, dimensions of this. But again, in, for the PTSD symptoms, that hasn't been found to be the curative factor, but certainly as part of people's healing. And something I want to just point out, you know, is that this is contemplative for therapists too. You know, Libby and I are both long-term meditators who've, who've done retreats and are, you know, comfortable sitting with people. And, you know, it's one of the most privileged roles you can have is just to sit quietly with loving attention. And even when the person's, you know, not paying any attention to you and inside like this, it's still really important part of the process. And that contemplative practice that the therapist brings to it and embodies in the sessions really does create so much of the container 
And, and it's also a beautiful healing experience for us as therapists um, and really deepens our capacity as clinicians. Just a few words about integration. Again, Francis is gonna talk about this more, but just to emphasize, it's not just about what happens in the medicine sessions, profound as that may be. And in the integration process, the next day or the weeks in between medicine sessions, you know, we ask these kinds of questions. Well, what did you experience? What insights did you have? And often we don't necessarily explicitly ask this, but it comes up, you know, what resolutions did you make? People resolve that they're gonna play piano more, that they're gonna be more playful with their children and they're gonna spend more time in nature. And we ask people about these things and support them to integrate those experiences and those intentions in the work. And that's one of the most important things about this work. And in that integration phase, you know, again, we can flexibly draw on a variety of models and interventions that we have and that the clients bring to things in terms of meditation practice, yoga, creative arts, dance, whatever it might be. Um, again, with a light touch, supporting them and really supporting their creativity and their playfulness. I can't emphasize enough how play and creativity are just so central to these experiences and especially the integration process. And this is a quote and a work of art from perhaps the most famous MDMA uh, assisted psychotherapy participant, a guy named Nick Blackston, who's been public about this, so I can say his name. Um, and he's featured in a book called The Acid Test, which is poorly titled uh, Acid Test, but it's really about MDMA primarily. It features Rick Doblin, Michael Midhofer, and uh, Nick. And it's a wonderful uh, book that I encourage you to check out. And so this is a quote from Nick. As interesting as the sessions are, I know from experience now that it's even more interesting what happens after the sessions when you're making connections. And again, these aren't just cognitive connections. These are embodied connections. These are you know, creative, visual connections, playful connections. And other aspects of contemplative things that emerge uh, in the sessions and continue to unfold afterwards. You know, so this is a quote from our most recent MDMA assisted participant uh, and uh, that Libby and I worked with. He said, my mind and experience have more depth, a slower pace, like a river with a slower current. And he said, I'm able to sit with difficult experiences for a while as opposed to being swept away, which any student of mindfulness, of course, you know, would recognize as, as language and metaphors. And another part of his, and, and, and so many people do this work, you know, in terms of the contemplative aspects is the contemplative focus on their values and their intentions. And so he talked about channeling peace and letting go of materialism and turning the other cheek. He used a Christian phrase and serving his community. You know, so these were just quotes of our most recent participant and things that he accessed and resolved to seek to embody with the support of other people in his community and his therapist and friends. And so that's so important part of this. It's not just about processing the difficult stuff, but really embracing and seeking to embody and get the support to embody one's values and really you know, following through on those intentions. And so to sum up, um, this is a method that clinically and contemplatively is non-directive and really respects and, and nurtures that inner healing intelligence within all of us. It's about the spontaneous emergence of elements from multiple therapies. Um, but as a therapist, recognizing that, being responsive, as Rick said, not directive, and with a real light touch in the way we bring the skills and tools that we have uh, to the sessions and to the integration work. And again, you know, in these medicine sessions and in the time unfolding, I mean, the experience can remain very intense for days and sometimes weeks afterwards, but people can have this intensified access to contemplative capacities within themselves, to contemplative experiences, and we could call them contemplative processes in this work. And yeah, I just wanna emphasize again that the process continues to unfold and deepen and the more people can have space in the days and weeks afterwards to, to make room for the integration process and to allow that inter, inner wisdom and playfulness and creativity of healing to unfold within themselves, um, you know, that's gonna be so much better for them 